Hey everyone, welcome back to another great episode of Know Your Legends Unsolved Murders. Uh, my name is Matt Jarbo and I'm your host. Uh, also, I run Kazon Radio. So, uh, you know, you guys have been paying attention to the show. You guys like it so far? We, you know, we're on like our fourth episode of this new series. Uh, I know I'm not releasing them as fast as I did other ones, but uh, once a week I think is great. Um, and we're getting a lot of really great responses from you guys listening at home and I, I, I love that. Uh, this particular week we're going to be talking about the phantom killer which is an uh, an unidentified serial killer uh you know responsible for slayings between february 22nd and may 3rd 1946 um it actually uh happened in a uh, uh texarkana um and it inspired the 1976 movie the town that dreaded sundown which i've i i saw uh, a couple years ago at a grand house festival in los angeles uh the movie is awesome it's just it, it, the fact that this it, it actually is based on a true story um and it made me fear men who wear burlap sacks on their head. So I really recommend seeing it if you can find it somewhere. Uh, it's great. But uh, we're going to get into the murders because it's definitely interesting. Um, and uh, we'll get into that right now. So here we go. The first attack happened on February 22nd, 1946, close to midnight. The phantom attacked James B. Hollis, 24, and Mary Jean Larry, 19. Jimmy Hollis received three fractures to his skull after being hit twice with a heavy blunt object. Mary Jean Larry was sexually assaulted with the perpetrator's pistol. Jimmy made his way to the Richmond Road where he flagged down a passing motorist who then contacted help. Mary ran off to get help when the attacker saw headlights and was scared off. Jimmy stayed in the hospital for several months. Mary did not stay in the hospital but received stitches to her head. The attack happened somewhere near Stevenson Street off Richmond. A month later, on the evening of March 23rd, Richard Griffith, 29, and his girlfriend, Polly Ann Moore, 17, were murdered. Both were found next morning in Griffin's car on a rural Bowie County road outside Texarkana. Both had been shot in the back of the head by a 32 revolver. A bloodstained patch of earth found 20 feet away suggests that both victims were killed outside their car and then put back in it. The third attack happened early Sunday morning, April 14th, between 2 a.m. and 5.30 a.m., resulting in a second double murder. The victims were Betty Jo Booker, 15, and her friend Paul Martin, 16. Paul's body was found first at 6 a.m., lighting beside the north side of the North Park Road. Blood was found on the other side of the road a short distance up the street from his body. His body was found somewhere around the 6700 block of North Park Road. He was shot to death, receiving four shots. His car was found about a mile and a half away, about 400 yards away from the entrance of Spring Lake Park. Betty's body was found later around 11.30 a.m. behind a tree a few yards off the north side of Morris Lane, about a mile away from Paul. She was also shot to death, having received two shots. By this time, the citizens of Texarkana had entered a state of panic. Many residents bought firearms, barricaded their residences, and stayed in at night. The police, meanwhile, were, began patrolling Texarkana's secluded streets and lovers' lanes, apparently prompting the Phantom to change tactics. On May 3rd, a man attacked a farmhouse in Miller County, Arkansas, about 10 miles outside Texarkana. The prowler, standing outside the house, shot Virgil Starks 36 twice through a parlor window, killing him. Virgil's wife, Katie, 35, upon hearing the breaking glass, left her bedroom and entered the parlor. The assailant, still outside the house, shot her twice, hitting her in the face and mouth. But Mrs. Stark managed to escape from the house and get to help from a neighbor. While Mrs. Stark sought egg, the killer searched their house, leaving muddy footprints on the floor. By the time the police, by the time police had searched the house, the killer had gone. Although ballistics tests would later reveal the bullets removed from the Sark's house had been fired from a 22 semi-automatic pistol, not a 32 revolver, the murder of Virgil Starks is generally believed to have been committed by the Phantom. Two days later, a man's body was found on the train tracks north of Texarkana. Some reporters speculated that the man was Earl McSpadden, was, that he was a Phantom, that he had committed suicide. However, following the coroner's report of May 7th, it was revealed that McSpadden had been stabbed to death before his body was put on the tracks leading some to believe that McSpadden was another victim of the Phantom. Killer's Profile The killer had been described by only the first two victims. Many of the killer's other victims wouldn't live to give a description. The only other survivor was Katie Starks, but she never saw the killer and was unable to provide a, provide a description of him. The first two victims, Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry, described him as being six feet tall with a white hood mask over his head with holes cut for the eyes and mouth. The mask was described as being similar to a sugar sack with jagged holes cut in the material. 
When asked, neither Hollis or Larry could agree as to whether the assailant was dark-toned man or a light-skinned black man. Bowie County Sheriff Bill Presley said, The killer is the luckiest person I've ever known. No one sees him, hears him in time, or can identify him in any way. The headlines on May 5th, two days after the Starks' murder, read, Sex Maniac Hunted and Murders. An unarmed officer once said, I believe a sex pervert is responsible. The Leading Suspect The prime suspect in the Phantom case was Yowl Swinney, 29, a a car thief with a record of counterfeiting, burglary, and assault, who was arrested in Texarkana on July 1946. Swinney's wife, who was also arrested, told police that Swinney was the Phantom and that she had been with her husband when he committed the murders. Swinney's wife kept changing the details about the killing, however, and police came to view her as an unreliable witness. After being questioned by the police in Texarkana, Swinney was questioned in Little Rock, Swinney was eventually convicted of car theft in Texas and, as a repeat offender, was sentenced to life imprisonment in 1947. In 1970, Swinney petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus, claiming he should not be released because he had not been represented by counsel in a 1941 felony conviction that was used to enhance his sentence in 1947. Swinney's life sentence was overturned on appeal, and he was set free in 1973. He died in 1974. The case of the Phantom was never solved and remains open, although as of 2006, it was considered a cult. So a guy runs around with like a burlap sack on his head and shoots people in the face. It's an interesting killer. Um, you know, that, that's the only problem with these ones that are unsolved. It's like, why did they do it? You know, but this guy, if you look at it, he, he frequented like lovers lanes. He went after couples that were out. So this guy probably had a thing against couples. You know, he maybe mommy, daddy issues. I have no idea. But looking at his victims, it seems that that's going to be the, the basis for what he does is, you know, that's how he kills him. But the Stark killing is interesting because he shot a guy through a house. Everyone else had been like in cars. Yet he goes to someone's house, shoots him twice, shoots his wife. She runs away and he then goes and burgles the house. I don't know. And she never saw him. And it was with a 22 at 22 semi-automatic pistol. So it's different caliber gun. She never saw his face. Couldn't see if he had a, had like a, um, um, uh, burlap sack on or sugar sack on. So it's kind of interesting, but again, these are just my thoughts. I'm curious. What are yours? Please head over to Kazon radio on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, Kazon radio.com. You guys can email us at Kazon radio at gmail.com. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher and YouTube and uh, let us know what you think and tune in next week for another episode on unsolved Myst- or <laughs> not unsolved mysteries because that's another show, but Kazon radios, know your legends, unsolved murders. I'm Matt Jarbo. I'll see you guys then. Bye.